Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Lecture 12, our last lecture in English 2105, uh, British Literature from its beginnings to 1700. So we, uh, we will close off today's lecture uh, by discussing uh, one of the greatest works, if not the greatest work in, uh, in English literature, Paradise Lost by John Milton. So we had a, a recorded lecture, uh, it wasn't live, uh, that began to discuss some of the epic context of Paradise Lost uh, in this lecture. We'll focus mainly on the figure of Satan as, as depicted in, in book one and, uh, uh, and uh, a little bit of, of book two. Um, and we'll try to, to get a better handle on the, let's say our perspective on Satan and, and are we to take this as um, as this, as uh, uh, the hero of this epic, are we supposed to be rooting for Satan? Or uh, is part of the uh, a thesis I, I started to articulate last time, part of the education uh, process that we find in the epic is, is that our perspective on Satan is changes. We, we are lured into the rhetoric of Satan, the, the, the images of Satan, Satan's power, and then come to realize, so to speak, the powerlessness of Satan um, throughout the course of the epic. So those two, I want to concentrate on that question. We won't have time to go through the whole epic uh, um, uh, very closely. We'll, we'll go through fairly closely um, some of the key speeches in book one, but uh, we won't have a chance to go through the, the the entire epic as a whole, but if we concentrate on this question, you should be fairly well armed to deal with the the final exam question on uh, on uh, on Satan in Paradise Lost. So uh, just a reminder, then the final exam is your next uh, your next assignment, your your final assignment in this course. It's due August seventh. I've had a couple of questions about that, of, and. Uh, just another reminder, it's August 7th um, and uh, due at midnight, uh, posted in Word or PDF on the Brightspace page, okay? And you have two questions on that final exam. They're already posted in the syllabus. They're already, it's already also on the, uh, the uh, uh, Brightspace assignments tab there. Um, one question is on Antony and Cleopatra. One is on Milton's Paradise Lost. Very broad question, so I'm not looking for any particular answer, just you engaging uh, in, in some sense with, the, um, with the, the play on the one hand and with the epic on the other in relation to some very broad thematics that within which you can narrow down what, what you want to say. Okay, any, any questions on the final exam before we, we move on to um, to discuss uh, to discuss Milton again. Okay, hearing none, I'm going to uh, share the screen with you on uh, to continue this uh, presentation on the uh, Paradise Lost, the beginnings of Paradise Lost, and and the portrayal of Satan in uh, in that book. So the big question, since the beginning of, uh, since, since the beginning of first publication of the epic has been, is Satan in some way the hero of, of this work? Uh, he's the first person we see in terms of, of the narrative unfolding of the epic. So we, um, just as in, um, in the, the uh, Aeneid, you, 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 you were introduced quite quickly to the concerns of Aeneas, um, uh, who's the hero. So to hear, uh, we, we have a narrative uh, setting of the stage for the first 80 lines or so, and zeroing in right on our hero is the first character who ex speaks, the first character whose sympathy we, uh, uh, or whose perspective we're invited to share. Um, um, and often that's a, a signal of who, uh, who is the, the good guy, so to speak, in, in one of these works. So early readers felt Milton was too sympathetic to Satan, 
And uh, so this is obviously a religious problem. Why, why present Satan so sympathetically? Um, and uh, also has a political dimension <clears throat> because Satan can be seen as um, a, uh, uh, the Republican who revolts against an imperial or, or powerful monarch in the form of God. Um, and, uh, and Milton obviously shared these political Republican leanings and uh and had a uh, had this sense of potentially this being at going on in the background um do i have a hand up michael uh yeah, yeah. can you hear me can, uh can you hear me right now yeah can you re repeat the question michael i couldn't quite hear you sorry oh, wait can you hear me right now yeah Oh, okay. Um, my question was, uh, when you say he's uh, a Republican, do you mean like uh, like Roman Republican, as in like they, they, they're they for the Republic, or do you mean like modern Republican? Uh, very good question. Uh, m I guess modern Republican, because Milton's writing in the context of, um, of, of English, of, of the monarchy in England, right? So uh, in the 17th century, and uh, there, it, it was a republicanism in that context, as opposed to the Roman uh, republicanism, but obviously shared the same philosophical points of departure that in a republic, um, individuals, uh, in, individual citizens are able to invest themselves more in the political things. Uh, remember, uh, remember we said uh, republic comes from raise publica, so the, the common things that the, that the political uh, affairs of the community are common to all of us and, and, and belong to all of us as opposed to are the private concerns of a monarch or emperor. So, um, so these questions were raised uh, during the Renaissance in Italy early on, so 14th century, 15th century, um, but also in England, during uh, the 17th century, there was, of course, a civil war. Uh, we talked a bit about this in the context of uh, when we talked about introduction to the Renaissance. And then in the first recorded lecture, I talked a bit about Milton's role in that. So Milton was uh, uh, supported the Republican cause in the civil war, became so in that civil war, uh, there were royalist forces battling parliamentary forces who wanted to to check at the power of the monarch, first of all, and then eventually that the aims got bigger and they wanted to depose and they eventually executed the monarch, Charles. And there was um, a Republican, a short-lived Republican government in England uh, called the Commonwealth from uh, 1649 to uh, 1660, uh, give or take. So, uh, so during this time, Milton was a, uh, a secretary with different, uh, different portfolios for the government. So he he's participated very much in that Republican government, wrote treatises defending the actions of that Republican government, uh, uh, treatises on, on the tenure of kings and magistrates, so, so that the, the, the tenure of a king is, is at the power of the people, wrote treatises on... Um, on, on uh, checking ecclesiastical or ch church government, those types of things. So, uh, so good question. When I say Milton was a had Republican leanings, uh, Republican leanings, it's uh, modern Republicanism in the context of of the English Civil War and um, and the Commonwealth Republican government that uh, that was in power at that time. Um, and as, as I said, from that dimension, for people who, who keep in mind, let's say, Milton's uh, political leanings, uh, one could see, um, uh, ostensibly, Satan as this uh, figure that, uh, that um, Milton would want us to sympathize with, let's say, okay? So a little history of the, the devil here. Um, so um, the uh, 
kind of, um, by the way, sympathy of the, every time I think of that, sympathy of the devil is uh, obviously a um, Rolling Stones song, if, if people know that, but uh, they, I don't think they were talking about, about Milton's poem, but um, there's, a, there's a whole history to our conceptualization of this mythical figure, Satan, so to speak. Uh, so first of all, the word, so if we track it back, Satan and devil, where do these words come from? So devil is from Old English, dafol, and from Latin, diabolus, which is from the Greek, diabolus. And that was a translation of, in the, so the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the, what, we, what Christians called the Old Testament. Um, Diabolus was the Greek translation of Hebrew uh, Satan or Shatan, which in Hebrew just originally meant adversary or obstructor. So in the Hebrew Bible, there's a, so uh, early references to this figure are in the context of, um, uh, in the context of uh, the Hebrew God being one God in a council of divine entities. So um, uh, the Jewish religion was not always a monotheistic religion. It was, it became an, a monolatry, so the, the worship, monolatry, worship of one God, uh, but they believed originally in many of these Canaanite deities operating in a council, and their God was, was seen as paramount above them, for, for themselves at least, and um, had a special relationship with them originally. And this uh, Satan figure is uh, kind of, in some instances, a kind of a common noun for forces against the people, uh, the Hebrew people, or for one figure on this council, let us say. So you get that in the Job, uh, the Job reference, you know, the Satan or the, the accuser comes over to you know, as, as part of the divine council and says, oh God, you know, why is uh, this, this Job character is, uh, is not all that righteous, you know, he just hasn't had uh, uh, some tough things to go through and, 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 and uh, let's say, uh, uh, poses a, a bit of a kind of a wager over the future of, uh, of Job's um, devotion if he were to go through trials and tribulations. Through, from these very obscure references, over time, traditions around a rebellious angel who had a certain defined characteristics developed, okay? So that figure, first of all, originally has had no connection with uh, the Genesis story, the serpent in Eden. So that was a separate reference, let us say. And then um, it was only in the intertestamental period uh, it was only during that period that the serpent became associated with this Satan figure, okay? So the intertestamental period is, so some of the, between the, the last writings that are preserved in the Hebrew Bible, so a couple hundred BCE, to the first writings of the uh, New Testament, uh, so the first, which is the first century of the Common Era. So in that 300-year period or so, there developed some of these traditions of, of linking the serpent in the Garden of Eden to, to a, that Satan figure. Also the tradition of link, linking this Lucifer or morning star or dot, uh, day star. So Lucifer, the, another name for Satan, is uh, uh, referred to in Isaiah, but there in Isaiah, which uh, he, you know, uh, written, well, this part of Isaiah, written probably in the 6th century BCE, is not referring to Satan, is not referring to the serpent in the Garden of Eden, is referring to probably Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the ruler of Babylon. Um, and uh, it was only later on that that figure, that reference, uh, became associated with Satan and the serpent. So all of these start to become through later traditions amalgamated into this one kind of story of a rebellious angel who um, who rebelled against the rule of God 
uh, tempts humanity to evil as the serpent did in the Garden of Eden and is this kind of ongoing foe of humanity. Uh, so it wasn't until the early church fathers, so in the first couple centuries of the common era, that uh, the figure of the devil or Satan gained some sort of order. Uh, and these church fathers were um, operating in a tradition of what's uh, often called Gnostic or Manich Gnostic Manichaean dualism. So, uh, so a dualism that's not necessarily present in the original scriptural texts, this dualism would would pit, you know, a kind of a, uh, a a good god of spirit versus an evil god of matter. So there's a a god of matter that rules this world, the world of of things, and the world of becoming. And it later became equated with Satan, and then there's a god of spirit that's equated with, with, with the 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 god of the the, the Hebrew Bible, and in, so it's in it in its extreme form, uh, you know, it's it's almost it's it's no longer a real monotheism. Like there's another deity there, another force, another power. So in orthodox in orthodox Christian thinking, following Saint Augustine, who who tried to think this through philosophically and say, if we're, if we're to really think that God is um, omnipotent, uh, all powerful and, and all good, then what we think of as Satan and evil are not a real force in conflict with God. It is the absence of God, so to speak. It's a figure, it's an allegory, it's a, it's a name we put on, uh, the the the, the non-presence of God. So being, let's say, tempted by Satan is really just our souls turning away from Satan and being, let's say, somehow drawn to an uh, a, a distance from and an absence of God. So that's orthodox thinking, let's say, um, following Augustine. But there's still just within the tradition, within the way people, uh, it, it, stories of Satan try to or have to think of it, you know, we have to think of it, of, of, of these, you know, evil as, as a thing, you know, I mean, like, even though it's really no thing, it's the absence of being and presence, which is God. So that's kind of the philosophical uh, approach to it that Augustine wants us to take. But in, in everyday thinking, we think, well, no, there's this kind of demon that's made me do it or something like that. So, so that's part of the allegory and the fictions and the stories that, that, that get involved in in thinking about Satan, and it's very much the 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 thinking that Milton's presenting us with, and this is part of let's say the temptation that he presents us with that we we do kind of get sucked into thinking about Satan as having a power over us uh, and and one of the ways that this happens is through Satan's rhetoric, so we'll look at a bit of his speeches, but first of all, I just want to indicate it at the Satan's rhetoric, so the power of his, the convincing power of his speeches uh, draws uh, the reader in, but it also is reflected in how he's able to move the masses of these fallen angels. So uh, in book uh, one, he, uh, he's, there's all the angels, the fallen angels are on this burning lake in hell. He gets on the shore and, and, and uh, he he's rousing them up and he gives this stirring speech to say, you know, get up or be forever fallen. And, you know, and, and uh, so as uh, he does this rousing speech afterwards, the narrator says he spake and to confirm his words out flew millions of flaming swords drawn from the thighs of mighty cherubim, the sudden blaze far round illumined hell, highly they raged against the highest and fierce with uh, grasped arms clashed their sounding shields, the din of war, hurling defiance toward the vault of heaven. So ac actually that speech is um, uh, after, if I'm remembering well, is, is not when he's rousing them out of the lake. They've already left the lake and now he's given another speech on what they should do in terms of uh, deliberate on their next steps. And, uh, and th again, that speech 
gets a rousing round of applause, so to speak. So let's look at, so there's this, this uh, our, we looked at in the, the recorded lecture, I looked at the first 80 lines or so of the poem, which are, which are the narrator uh, describing the context we talked about, uh, especially in the first 26 lines of, of setting out the theme of the epic and, and the theodicy, so the, the, the determining, the justifying the ways of God to man. Um, and then uh, the narrator talks about, uh, you know, who caused this downfall of humanity. It was the, the, the infernal serpent and, uh, and talks about how he was in this uh, burning lake and casting his eyes around. And then until he sees one next to him, uh, long after known in Palestine and named Beelzebub, to whom the arch enemy and thence in heaven called Satan, with bold words breaking the horrid silence thus began. So I'll bring up, um, I'll bring up the, um, the actual poem now. So that you can follow along. <clears throat> so breaking the horrid silence thus began. <clears throat> so line 84. This is Satan's first speech. So before all this was the narrator speaking. And here Satan's first speech uh, addressed to Beelzebub, this, this kind of lieutenant uh, uh, fallen angel. If thou beest he, but oh how fallen, how changed, from him who in the happy realms of light, clothed with transcendent brightness, didst outshine myriads though bright. So if if that if if you are are he that I knew before in heaven, where where the in the realm of light that that was and you were clothed in light, you were so brilliant and so uh, uh, with uh, kind of the. Sh the shining forth of the spiritual element of oneself, but oh, how fallen. Uh, Michael, another question about the philosophical component. Go ahead, unmute, unmute yourself. Um, I had a question about, okay, so you mentioned uh, uh, Augustine of Hippo, right? Um, do you think that possibly Thomas Aquinas had an influence on this story? Because I know that Thomas Aquinas all, uh, like uh, reworked the perspective that uh, Augustine had because Augustine's uh, perspective kind of went out of fashion like per se I guess is the best word for it like it he he reworked it because Thomas sorry no uh, sorry uh, because Augustine's uh, perspective uh, was quite strict and he I believe he reworked it to make it a little bit more uh, easier for the people to follow his teachings uh, okay, yeah. Um, so Milton, uh, so uh, so definitely you're right. Uh, Orthodox Christianity had, first of all, in Augustine, uh, its its main, let's say, out outlining of Orthodox opinion, uh, and he's writing around uh, 400 of the Common Era, and then in the uh, the 12th, 13th century, uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas um, brings more of an Aristotelian frame of reference to that okay so so what the corrections there mostly have to do with um well not necessarily corrections but different interpretations of how to think about uh substance based on aristotelian metaphysics as opposed to Plat platonic metaphysics which was augustine's point of departure yeah uh that's uh, sorry that's why i meant too like I, I wasn't saying that like if someone wants to look at a uh, 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 Augustine and and like believe that that's fine sorry that sounds kind of weird what I mean is, is that like it was just a, he looked at uh, Thomas Aquinas just looked at it in a different way I was wondering if that influenced it they're both yeah. equally viable at the end of the day yeah no that's a good question um, Milton was not um, so uh, the Renaissance so basically from that period August uh, Aquinas uh, so around 1300 let's say so uh, Aquinas and those around him uh, 
developed this system called scholasticism, which is heavily influenced by Aristotelian philosophy and was uh, basically everything studied in the universities from circa 1300 to circa 1600, let's say. Uh, it was then displaced during the Renaissance by uh, again, a rebirth of Plato. So again, the Renaissance went back and picked up Plato again. So Ficino that I mentioned when I was talking about the Renaissance, um, but also um, the beginnings of a new scientific approach basically discarded a lot of the Aquinian metaphysics. So, uh, so Milton went very revolutionary in that. Uh, so he, he felt you could learn more about how to be a good Christian from, um, I forget who he says this, he learned more from, from the poets like Spencer than he did from, from Aquinas. So he was very anti-Aquinas because it, it made it too much of, a, of a, an exercise in um, Aristotelian logic as opposed to, uh, as opposed to um, uh, faith and grace, so to speak, okay? So it's a good question, like he's definitely another major figure in the history of thinking about like Christian philosophical understanding of what it means to be, you know, uh, divine. Milton, probably less influenced by him, at least consciously, there's probably unconscious influence there. Does that help? Michael? Uh, yeah, it does. Sorry, thank you. Uh, that does help. Yeah. I was, I was just wondering because uh, I do know that uh, mm. Uh, th yeah, Thomas Aquinas kind of brought back, well, no, it, he didn't bring back Augustine because Augustine was still super important in the church. But right. he, yeah, he mixed it with sort of a, 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 what you're saying, uh, Aristotelian thinking, which yeah. uh, what we, we probably, today we look more to uh, Thomas Aquinas because I remember uh, Augustine had some, some of his uh, opinions are pretty dated now. Oh, I definitely. Believe. Yeah, like, well, it, and it depends on what we're talking about, but definitely even Aquinas is, is dated. Mm. But you're right, uh, Aquinas would be, in terms of Christian thinking, probably today there's, uh, if it comes to a particular uh, particular um, stance on, uh, on a social issue, yeah. Aquinas is not going to be, you know, the, I mean, Augustine is not going to be the person people turn to as this is the end gospel on how to interpret that social issue mm -hmm. um so uh the one the one uh difference that happens with the renaissance and then the protestant reformation is a aquinas uh was uh well not discarded but the questioning of aquinas around the role of grace began so there's more of a role for um individual will in Aquinas. So uh, the, um, let's say the individual power of someone to save themselves, so to speak, through reason. Um, whereas, uh, so for Protestants following Luther, you know, you're fallen and it's only through divine grace that, um, that you can, uh, you know, save oneself. And Milton's, in, we'll see a little bit there, you know, when we see Milton talking about the power of choice. The power of choice is always within uh, kindly, kind of a divine dispensation of grace. But he does emphasize the power of um, choice. So in, in that sense, it's 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 a strange combination of of of, of uh, August Augustinian and 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 let's say and Luther's. Ex, uh, uh, kind of making making of that position extreme and, and uh, Aquinas. Okay, uh, good. So very good question. Yeah. Um, Thank you. The uh, now so he's so basically he's turning to Beelzebub, and uh, he's he's saying uh, you know boy you've really you've really gone downhill you know, since I remember seeing you in heaven, you know, clothed in brightness. If he who mutual league, united thoughts and counsels, equal hope, and hazard in the glorious enterprise, joined with me once, now misery hath joined in equal ruin. 
So you, you joined with me in a great enterprise of rebelling against God once, and now we're joined in equal ruin. Into what pit thou seest, from what height fallen? So much the stronger proved he with his thunder, and till then who knew the force of those dire arms? Yet not for those, nor what the potent victor in his rage can else inflict, do I repent or change. Though changed in outward, outward luster, that fixed mind and high disdain from sense of injured merit, that with the mightiest raised me to contend, and to the fierce contention brought along innumerable force of spirits armed, that durst dislike his reign, and me preferring, his utmost power with adverse power opposed, in, duty, in dubious battle on the plains of heaven, and shook his throne. So, uh, yet, yet not for all this. So we're obviously uh, in, in a horrible situation now, but not for this or whatever else can happen, do I repent or change. Though changed in outward luster, so although we, don't, we, we lack the, the angelic shining light now, like they, so they're kind of, they're still immortal like the other angels, but they've lost the outward luster and uh, the, the, the spiritual brightness of the other angels, and they, they become like their hellish surroundings. Uh, though changed in outward luster, that fixed mind and high disdain. So, so despite his outward appearance and outward condition, he has a fixed mind. And it's almost um, it's interesting. It's there, the way it's self-presented by Satan, it's almost something, again, it's, sympathetic you can say okay yeah well that's something that sometimes we have to do you know we're in a you know maybe we're in a tough situation as humans that we can't control but we have to have a, a fixed mind and and we have to kind of persevere and 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 uh and and maybe what we see here in satan is the kind of heroic resolve that we could admire uh so that would be one way of seeing satan's speech there okay um and in the high disdain from sense of injured merit. So he, his, his disdain was from, so he's, uh, we find out later more of this is described when Raphael describes the war in heaven in book, uh, book uh, five and six, is that um, things are going along peaceably, I guess, in heaven, all the angels are having a good time, you know. And uh, then God proclaims that the sun, so the second aspect of the deep, the divinity will it will be raised as higher than the other angels, and uh, that they will need to worship him. So this begins it's this sense. This is what begins uh, Satan's sense of injured merit. So he feels that he's just as deserving of as of this honor as others, uh, I guess. And that's what uh, let's say uh, spurred him to gather these forces and rebel against God. So I'm picking up again on line 105 uh, and, 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 and shook his throne in the battle in the plains of heaven. Note, notice, I'll just also point out, uh, in dubious battle on, uh, on, on the plains of heaven. So uh, so it's, it's dubious in the sense, a couple of senses, it's kind of doubtful. Like, so maybe the out, outcome's doubtful, but it's uh, dubious in the sense that it's, uh, that he shouldn't have, he shouldn't have done it. Um, what, though the field be lost, all is not lost. The unconquerable will and study of revenge, immortal hate and courage never to submit or yield. And what is else not to be overcome? That glory sh never shall his wrath or might extort from me. To bow and sue for grace with suppliant knee and deify his power, who from the terror of this arm so late doubted his empire, that were low indeed, that were an ignominy and shame beneath this downfall. Since by fate the strength of gods and this imperial substance cannot fail, since through experience of this great event in arms not worse, in foresight much advanced, we may with more successful hope resolve to wage by force or guile eternal war, irreconcilable to our grand foe, who now triumphs 
and in the excess of joy, soul reigning holds the tyranny of heaven. So he's saying, uh, so I'm not, I, despite all this, uh, what's happened, you know, we shook his, his throne, and though the field is lost, though that battle was lost, all is not lost. We have an incomparable will. We have, uh, we have the ability to study ways of, 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 uh, of getting revenge. Of, we have immortal hate. So just hatred. So again, this, what spurs uh, Satan is not kind of a, it's, it's not out of a, a sense of inward justness of his cause. It's always directed well, it's directed from pride and injured pride, but also hatred and reaction against all that's, uh, uh, that, that which opposes him. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to bow and sue for grace with suppliant knee and defi uh, deify his power, that were low indeed. So it would be worse than the current downfall. So uh, that, that pride, he cannot bend his knee, cannot humbly ask forgiveness. And this is what Adam and Eve will have to do, right? The, the difference with Adam and Eve's fall is that they're still able to turn to God and humbly ask forgiveness. So humanity's hope, let's say, is, and, and humanity's hope in not have, sharing a fate of eternal hell, uh, according to Milton, is humility, love, and, and I want to, I want to emphasize that as, as kind of the themes of the poem is, is humility and love and, and both in terms of, let's say, the religious sense in the relationship to whatever conception of the divine one has, but also with one another. So Adam and Eve are, uh, after they fall in book nine, it describes them at the end of book nine, and then in book 10 as, as, it, as in this kind of irreconcilable war based on the same types of emotions we see here in, in, in Satan, you know, injured merit and pride. And how can you say it was my fault? It was your fault, you, your fault, you did it, you did it. And, and, and in every, I, you know, I think, I don't know if, you, if, 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 if any of you've been in kind of relationships with a partner and, and, and there, will, there will be arguments and, and, the argument could go on interminably if one of the partners doesn't, let's say, swallow the pride and make the first step and say, you know, and humbly ask forgiveness and, and, and say, you know, like, uh, and, and say, you know, I, I don't know why I was, was being that silly, you know, let's, let's salve each other's wounds, you know, let's, let's uh, do what we can to, to get through this together. Um, so, so Satan can't do this. He cannot because he sees this, any type of turn as, as would be uh, a public shame and ignominy and, and, and shame beneath this downfall. And then he says, since fate, so fate we know is the, here is the will of, of, of God, the strength of God, so angels, and this imperial substance cannot fail. Since, since, we as angels cannot are, are immortal and, and and we cannot be harmed and since through the experience of this of the event our arms are the same but our foresight has been advanced so we've learned how powerful he is and and what to do we've learned from the experience and we cannot harm so of course there is a certain logic to this you know so we're immortal we have the same strength as we did before we've gained a little bit of knowledge so I say we keep going, you know, and keep trying to attack and, you know, uh, 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 and, and maybe the outcome will be different. Um, we may with more successful hope resolve to wage by force or guile, so either through outward attack or guile, eternal war irreconcilable irre to our grand foe who now triumphs. So he's saying, you know, uh, I'm not going to bend my knee. We're immortal. We've learned from that experience. I say we keep going in some way to try to, to continue this war. Now, Beelzebub, I won't go through Beelzebub's reply, but first I just want to point out actually the narrator's interjection here. So spake the apostate angel, though in pain, vaunting aloud, but racked with deep despair. Okay. And him thus answered, Soon his bold come here. So, so then the narrator introduc introduces the speech by 
Beelzebub, with those first two lines I just want to underscore. So it's uh, almost a direct parallel to um, Aeneas, uh, the Aeneid, book two, uh, sorry, book one. So Aeneas uh, has just roused his troops who, you know, been dispersed by a storm, you know, and he's, he's got to rally them and say, you know, let's, let's get moving, you know, and, 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 and let's keep going. All is not lost. And then the narrator interjects after the speech and says, I, I've got it written down here because my memory is not this good. Brave words, sick with mounting cares, he assumes a look of hope and keeps his anguish buried deep in his heart. So, um, so the narrator undercuts this, the brave speech of Aeneas. So Aeneas is rousing his troops uh, and saying, you know, we can keep going, not, all's not lost. And, and then the narrator undercuts it, says, you know, he's speaking bravely, but is burying his anguish and despair in his heart, you know, because he has to have that brave faith. So to hear Satan, again, another parallel, like Aeneas, like the hero of that epic, so to uh, kind of a heroic deed here, he's trying to rouse the troops. He's, he's putting on a brave face for them. So spake the apostate angel, though in pain, vaunting aloud, but racked with deep despair. The other way of looking at it is that the narrator's undercutting uh, the strength and hope that we see in Satan. So Satan uh, could be seen as this brave figure uh, uh, with a defiant mind. Uh, but here, after he speaks, everything is undercut by the narrator saying, he says this, but deep down there's despair. Under this hope, there's despair. So, uh, so a couple ways of looking at that. So Beelzebub, in the next speech replies, uh, we won't go through it, but <clears throat> basically says, okay, well, you want to keep going and keep, keep, uh, keep the war against God going there, but he's all powerful. So, you know, the, the, the seemingly logical step of, 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 of Satan saying, you know, well, we, maybe we can learn from that, you know, uh, and we'll try again and maybe it'll be a different outcome. And, um, uh, Beelzebub says, well, it's illogical. He's all powerful. You know, he's, it's, uh, it, it's infinity, still infinity. Even if you add a couple more troops or get a little bit better strategy, that's a thousand and one versus a f infinity. He's still infinitely powerful. Um, what, and what if he, he also says, what if he lifts, left us alive to suffer and do his will? So everything he's, he's allowing us to do these things in order to further his own will, which is again a Christ, the Christian understanding of providence that we are that this is a that the fall of 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 the presence of evil that that the fall of humanity is a fortunate fall because it leads to a certain divinely planned out end. Okay, so so Beelzebub says, well, have you thought about this? Like maybe. He wants us to try to continue this war and everything that we try to do, he's just bending to his own kind of good end, you know? So, so here's the response from Satan, starts at fallen cherub. Um, so uh, uh, fallen cherub, to be weak is miserable, doing or suffering. But of this be sure, to do what good never will be our task, but ever to do ill our sole delight as being the contrary to his high will whom we resist. So what we do will always be ill to his, his ends. We will not be doing good for, for him. Uh, if then his providence out of our evil seek to bring forth good, so if his providential ends tries to bring some good out of the evil we're doing, uh, our labor must be to pervert that end. And out of good still find, uh, still to find means of evil, which oft times may succeed, so as perhaps shall grieve him, um, if I fail not and disturb his inmost counsels from their destined aim. So, uh, so uh, he already the rhetoric, the, the 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 kind of the boasting, has been brought down a notch here. So here he's saying. 
So uh, we, we have to continue to try to do evil. And if he tries to turn that evil into some good, we have to take that good and keep trying to put it to evil. And it may sometimes grieve him. I don't know. Uh, so that instead of saying that we can win or we can overpower or we can achieve our ultimate, our ultimate aims, he, he's just saying if we repeatedly uh, uh, try to do this, we, we might become a nuisance to him. So, you know, basically, if we wanted to, to paraphrase it. Um, uh, so, so let's say the, um, the forcefulness of, uh, of Satan's rhetoric here is already, if we, if we attend to it closely, has already taken a step down. Um, but see the angry victor hath recalled his ministers of vengeance and pursuit back to the gates of heaven. So look, the um, uh, the angry victor so has called so has called back the 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 good angels has called them back because they were there firing firing uh, burning hail at them and and lightning and thunder um, back to the gates of heaven the sulphurous hail shot after us in storm or blown hath laid the fiery surge uh, that from the precipice of heaven received us falling. And the thunder, winged with red lightning and impetuous rage, perhaps hath spent his shafts and ceases now to bellow, th to bellow through the vast, boundless deep. Let us not slip the occasion, whether scorn or satiate fury yield it from our foe. So let's not lose this occasion. So, um, so the angels have been called back. We don't have this hail of thunder and burning sulfur raining down on us right now. So, so we have a bit of an occasion, a bit of a window to seize now uh, to, to do something. Um, Seest thou yon dreary plain, forlorn and wild, the seat of desolation, void of light, save what the glimmering of these livid flames casts pale and dreadful. Thither let us tend from off the tossing of these fiery waves. There rest if any rest can harbor there, and reassembling our afflicted powers, consult how we may henceforth most offend our enemy, our own loss how repair, how overcome this dire calamity, what reinforcement we may gain from hope, if not what resolution from despair. So uh, says, uh, you know, let's use this occasion to head over to that, uh, to the, the shore of this fiery, this burning lake, and uh, and try to uh, and, and try to kind of rally the troops, uh, reassemble our, our afflicted powers, and consult on our next steps. So, are we going to kind of be resolved in despair? Can or is there some hope of something that that we can achieve? Um, uh, I want I'll I'll just continue then. Um, uh, with the next lines, uh, and I want to point out uh, this great simile that we're about to approach. So now the narrator is speaking. Thus Satan, talking to his nearest mate, with head uplift above the wave, and eyes that sparkling blazed, his other parts besides, prone on the flood, extended long and large, lay floating many a rood in bulk as large as whom the fables name of monstrous size. So he's laying, so now we get this kind of physical description of Satan. And again, we can take this as a description of Satan that is, that, that can, that is of him as, uh, as large, as powerful, as more powerful than any of these other creatures you may have seen in other epic stories or myths. And he, he's greater than all of these. Um, he he uh, ex lay, sorry, lay floating many a rood in bulk as huge as whom the fables name of monstrous size, Titanian or earthborn that warred on Jove, Briarios or Typhoon, whom the dem by ancient Tarsus held, or that sea beast Leviathan. So both uh, both the the the, the Greek legends of of titans or or hundred-handed ones that that warred against uh, uh against uh the uh, the olympic deities uh 
and uh, and that were eventually uh, um, eventually subdued. So so too Satan, uh, who like those titans, warred against kind of a let's say an Olympian deity of light. So there's those Greek uh, those Greek myths that can be compared to to Satan, but also within the Hebrew Bible itself, Leviathan, the sea beast uh, that's referred to several times in the uh, the, the Hebrew uh, the, the Hebrew Bible, created hugest that swim the ocean stream, him haply slumbering. So again, here's where the epic similes start. Him haply slumbering on the Norway's foam. The pilot of some small night foundered skiff, deeming some island, oft as seamen tell, with fixed anchor in his scaly ride, moors by his side under the lee, while night invests the sea with wished morn delays, and wished morn delays, so stretched out huge in length, the arch fiend lay chained on the burning lake. So, uh, so it's describing Satan as, as being kind of prone on this burning lake, but he's huge. He's huge like these Greek uh, titans. He's huge like Leviathan from the Hebrew Bible. And, that, the, and then the, the comparison is of Leviathan. So he's, Satan is big like Leviathan, which is like those, those, uh, those, large creatures that you hear of in uh, in seamen's fables where a, 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 a seaman thinks they're uh, anchoring on an island at night uh, but it's really this large uh, sea beast maybe a whale they don't you know and they, they don't know really in these tales um, and uh, and so and then the so so large and so prone was Satan uh, chained on that burning lake. So uh, the comparison is rich uh, in a number of ways in terms of how many different kind of cultural references it sends out there. But also uh, I want to point out that we as readers, like the, like the, uh, the sailor who thinks we're anchoring on something firm, are also anchoring ourselves in this simile on, um, on something unstable. So we think we're anchoring ourselves on an island. We think we have firm ground, but we're really anchored on Satan or a sea beast that is unstable and dangerous for our, for our well-being. So this, the simile works on those, those levels as well. Um, let's... Uh, Turn back to the presentation now to see. Um, so as I've mentioned, we, our early impressions of Satan as awe-inspiring hero, they, these impressions change as we're, as we're educated throughout the poem. And at the end of the poem, Satan is seen as nothing. So he starts this mythical warrior. So when, as he leaves the lake, it describes him, his, his shield is as big as the moon, his spear taller than any of the pines in Norway, um, I think it's Norway. Um, so he's he's this huge, uh, larger than larger than life uh, warrior in that tradition. Then in book four, it describes him entering the Garden of Eden as an eagle, uh, now an animal, but a noble animal, let us say. And then, but uh, at the end, in book ten, he ultimately becomes. Only a, a uh, and is powerless to return from this shape. The serpent, uh, in, in which form he he um, led to the downfall of humanity. So God forces him and all the other uh, all the other fallen angels in hell to take this shape of a, a of um, a serpent and their uh, 
uh, their uh, their hiss. The hiss of these serpents is what uh, Satan hears in Book Ten after announcing the glorious victory over humanity. So uh, we'll think we'll have to think about that in relationship to the rhetorical power of Satan that I described at the beginning. So we're tempted into this rhetoric of Satan. And, and like I said, there's, there's a couple of problems with that. The narrator undercuts the rhetoric. The rhetoric has logical problems in terms of how it says, oh, and we can do this. Uh, well, so-and-so is omnipotent. Yeah, but we can keep trying and it might grieve them a bit, you know? And then, uh, so, so there's problems with the rhetoric right off the bat, but it still, it still has an emotional power, let's say. At the end of the poem, uh, Satan returns after after his victory, so to speak, in the in the Garden of Eden. He's tempted uh, Eve, and and Adam has has uh, has followed suit in terms of uh, eating from the forbidden tree, uh, and he returns thinking, okay, I'm going to tell everybody this. There's going to be thunderous applause. They were already very supportive of my ideas before, so you know. And, and we looked at one of the speeches where he says, let's continue to battle against heaven. Let's figure this out. And, uh, you know, everyone responds with thunderous applause and the clanging of, of, of shield and spear. <clears throat> After Satan gives that speech in book 10, however, uh, what he turns expecting to find this raw of support, but all he hears is hiss. So the, the sound of an audience booing, you know, hissing. But the hissing is because all the devils have turned into serpents uh, uncontrollably and that's all they can do and then satan discovers that he himself has also changed and, uh, and, and beyond his control and he hisses back so so even the rhetoric the response of the, the rhetoric now is is has been reduced and satan's power has been utterly destroyed here <clears throat> um so yeah, his, his rhetoric becomes more obviously flawed, and we've we've seen a bit of that. Uh, and at first, we see Satan from a distance when we're, he's introduced by the by the narrator uh, as the infernal serpent. But then we're invited to share his perspective. You know, uh, you know that thought of lost happiness and lasting pain. You know, it, we can in, we're invited to share, be sympathetic with that perspective. But ultimately, we're we're sucked, so we're sucked into that perspective, and that's part of the temptation of the reader. And the temptation of the reader is the education of the reader, so to speak. Um, so I talked a little bit last time about the problem of hope in hell. So hope never comes, that comes to all, and that's allusion to abandon all hope, he who enter here, and Dante. Um, and, and this hope as what distinguishes humanity. So for our... our Let's say our hope is to retain hope, is, is to say that, you know, both, but we have a, let's say, according to Milton's theology, we have a God-given power to choose uh, within, you know, it's this power granted by grace, you know, not something earned. And we can, with, with God's help, choose the right path. And that's open to, to reason, so to speak. It's not some sort of mystery that, that can't be solved. Um, and this, um, something I want to like, maybe just say more clearly, I tried to say before. So, so Satan is this kind of, we have to think of Satan as a symbol or, or as a literary figure for kind of a metaphysical, uh, a metaphysical um, state of things, so to speak. So Satan and, and the presence of evil are, are markers for um, the absolute distance from pure being that is God. So the closer we are to God, the closer these individual entities we ourselves are at, are in terms of our being, i.e. being enduring, as living up to an essence, as, as kind of displaying that essence so the we we become closer and closer to non-being so non-existence so 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 temporal that we don't exist not 
showing forth some sort of essence, but only being fleeting and having no identity. More, the more that we turn away from God, according to Milton's theology. Um, and, but it's difficult for us in humans, as humans to think in those terms of Satan as just this absence of being. You know, we, we have to think of beings, okay? We have to think of entities. So uh, uh, we, so there's, uh, it's difficult for us to uh, think in these, let's say, Augustinian terms of evil as the negative existence of being. Um, Satan's rhetoric is powerful, but we realize that it is hollow. I, I'll just re reference there, the, again, the, the vaunting loud, but racked with despair, again, the narrator's qualification. Um, so I, I won't read this part, I don't think, but um, I'll just refer you to the fact that so, so they resolved to get out of the lake and to, um, to rouse the other fallen angels. And we see, uh, we see as Satan leaves the lake, this gigantic, impressive, heroic figure, forgetting what came before. So in 209 to 220, um, uh, I'll just refer to one of these lines, so 209, nor ever thence had risen or heaved his head, but that the will and high permission of all ruling heaven left him at large to his own dark designs. So. He's moving, he's doing these heroic, heroic ash actions, pulling himself from the lake. But the narrator's underscoring here how he doesn't even turn his head uh, on the burning lake without kind of the permission of God, okay? So the, his power is illusory in that sense. Um, so maybe we'll, <clears throat> maybe we'll turn to this, um, to this speech. So line 242 to 63. So uh, uh, again, this is um, this is Satan to Beelzebub. Okay, uh, is is this the region? This the soil, the climb. So they just left the lake, <laughs> you know, hoping. Oh, okay, looks a little better over there. Grass is always greener on the other side of hell, I guess. Yeah. So we get over there and it's burning. You know, it's not any better there. So, uh, so is this the region? This the soil, the climb. Again, said the the lost archangel. Uh, this the seat that we must change for heaven. This mournful gloom for the celestial light. Be it so, since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right, farthest from him is best, whom reason hath equaled, force hath made supreme, above his equals. Farewell, happy fields, where joy forever dwells. Hail, horrors, hail, infernal world, and thou, profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor. Who, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. So I'll just uh, point out that uh, Satan seems to be channeling Hamlet here. So Hamlet famously says in, in Act 2, Scene 2, there's, there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so, if I remember correctly. So, um, so to hear there's, it's, it, hell is not good or bad unless thinking makes it so. A mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. What matter where, if I be still the same? And what I should be all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater? Here at least we shall be free. The Almighty hath not built here for his envy, will not drive us hence. Here we may reign secure, and in my choice to reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. But wherefore let we then our 
faithful friends, the associates and co-partners of our loss, lie thus astonished on the oblivious pool and call them not to share with us their part in this unhappy mansion, or once more with rallied arms to try what may be yet regained in heaven or what more lost in hell. So, uh, so he says, uh, better to, a famous line, uh, better to reign uh, in hell than serve in heaven. So again, his pride. Um, but, also, uh, uh, but also very much a Republican spirit. You, you know, you could say, you know, I, I would rather uh, kind of have my own self-determination uh, in, uh, in a small plot of land than serve in a grand, a grand empire. Or I'd, uh, I'd, I'd rather kill myself, you know, Roman, the Roman spur to, to suicide. I'd rather commit suicide than than have my dignity, honor, and freedom trampled on. So, so you could see that defiant stance of rather reigning in hell than serving in heaven as as a republican stance. Um, and then he says, uh, let let's uh, kind of rouse our our associates who fell with us, and and get them to to. Uh, to rally and, and see if we can regain heaven or what more we can lose in hell, okay? Um, his, his rousing speech, I, I don't think I'll go through uh, his rousing speech of the, uh, of the fallen angels. Uh, I want to underscore this notion of choice and knowledge and free will. So, so choice is all important for Milton, you know. Uh, so, the Fairy Queen, which no, we didn't read in this course, but is a, a Renaissance epic by Edmund Spencer, uh, uh, written in uh, the 1590s. So, there, <clears throat> the beginning of book one is a choice, you know, the the knight. Is is uh, along with his uh, his uh, companion Una represents truth, and he wanders off the path and he loses truth. You know, so it's very symbolic. And the the rest of 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 that book is about the many paths of wandering that can happen after that error in choice. Um, we almost have a diff uh, an opposite trajectory in Paradise Lost. We have kind of the, the whole cosmos and the history of the cosmos unfolding to underscore the importance of this one choice. So it, it, it evolves, we hear the history of the cosmos, the, the, the forces of Satan, what God's plans are, and then all concentering on this choice that Eve and Adam have around this, this, this um, forbidden fruit. And, uh, the, that, that choice having cosmic proportions, so to speak. Um, Satan's choice, uh, the, uh, means he, in a sense, he lost his power to choose. But Adam and Eve choose to fall but retain their freedom to choose afterwards, okay? According to the narrator, at least. So the knowledge attained, one thing I want to highlight there is um, it's not some sort of denial of of science or knowledge, okay? So um, knowledge itself is not a forbidden, you know, it's not as though we should just shut our minds to knowledge and seeking knowledge. Um, so Milton is very much a modern person, you know, in a sense that, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, that, that knowledge is, is, is liberating to some extent, but he wants to have a certain, what humanity to have a sense of which, knowledge is useful you know some knowledge is less useful in helping us to know god than others and i've given an example here so raphael is explaining the cosmos and adam says well what about if, if the sun was at the center so there's kind of those competing cosmologies the copernican and the ptolemaic worldviews at at, at at stake there and raphael says this inquiry is not evil to ask or search i blame thee not uh but but he says not to bother with hidden matters, leave them to God, know yourself, and uh, keep your inquiries lowly wise. So keep your, your 
uh, pretensions to knowledge modest, so to speak. So, uh, um, so I think it's a, a search for knowledge within the framework of a kind of uh, Christian theology, so to speak. Um, so knowledge, let's say the, 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 the knowledge gained uh, in the fall of Adam and Eve is not necessarily, you know, it's, oh boy, they got civil, the knowledges of civilization and that's, that's what the fall is all about. You know, they learn technologies and sciences and, and that was a fall from some sort of original union with nature. So that's one way in which the fall has been traditionally interpreted in Genesis. But for, for Milton, uh, it, the fall is, and the knowledge gained in the fall is really a knowledge of uh, the experience of evil and, and disobeying God and, and, and uh, falling away from divine presence and being. So it's a, it, it's a knowledge of evil. Another time uh, in, in Areopagitica, which is this kind of defense of free speech that Milton wrote in uh, 1644, I believe, um, uh, Milton says that uh, the knowledge gained in, in the fall was, was uh, of how we have to know good through knowing evil. So, it's, uh, uh, so they already knew the good, but they, the knowledge of good and evil that was granted to them is, is knowing the good via the evil, so to speak, through kind of a distance from God, a mediated form of knowing. Um, I'll just close then by uh, talking a bit about what happens in book two, so you get a sense of uh, kind of the conclusion of that segment of the, um, of the epic. Uh, so Satan has roused the troops uh, at the end of book one and has said, let's consult together on what's the right course of action. So they say, okay, great idea. And they go and quickly build this hall, pandemonium, all devils, where, which will become this, like a parliament for them to discuss the, the next course of action. And this dialogue that occurs in book two, so the first part of book two is just this dialogue in pandemonium, this, this hall of all the de demons, uh, is a dialogue on, on the next steps. And it's a debate um, with, with long speeches on different courses of action. And it can be seen that this is the type of democratic dialogue that's, one way of approaching it is this is the type of democratic dialogue that's denied in heaven. So if, if we were to take a really political lens on it, and if we were to see Milton's politics coming through there, we could see again, this as a celebration of what Satan represents in some ways as, as not just towing the line uh, and what does that enable? It enables democratic dialogue rather than just listening to one tyrannical view. Uh, the other way of seeing this is that it's the, the, the speeches, they seem like a democratic dialogue, but, uh, but we have this uh, words clothed in reasons garb, the, uh, the narrator said. So there, it's not really these rational arguments. There's, uh, uh, there's a lot of irrationality to the speech. So what happens here is less a, a, again, a rational debate than allowing uh, irrational passions and pride to have a voice, so to speak. Uh, <clears throat> so Satan begins by asking what the approach should be. Moloch starts and says that they should continue their overt, overt war in heaven, saying it can't be worse than it is now. And then Belial says, no, he feels, you know, heaven's impregnable. That's silly, you know, and assault on it could be worse. You know, you can have a worse fate uh, than they currently are facing. And then uh, Mammon, who is this, uh, represents a, a fixation with wealth and all these things. Mammon asserts, you know, things could get, you know, we could get used to hell. I think I saw some gems there. You know, we could probably mine for gold. We could really spruce this place up. Uh, maybe get an air conditioner going or something like that, I guess, is the, the idea. Um, they and, and saying for him, you know, they, they let's make a home of it here in hell, and they couldn't serve in heaven. So Beelzebub, uh points out that the, the fall is absolute. There's no chance of planning a war to retake hell, heaven. And but hell is also a dungeon. So it's not better to we're not gonna be able to just uh, 
we're not going to be able to just put an air AC unit in and cool it off and maybe paint the walls a bit and we'll, everything will be fine. Um, that, that this is not good and we need to do something about the situation. So we can't rule here. God, first of all, it's, it, it, it's a dungeon and God rules here as well. We think we're ruling, but God rules as well. Um, and I'll just see, I've got a question here. Atifa, for the Paradise Lost portion of the final exam, are we expected also to find evidence um, of Satan as a hero in the other books or just from one to five? So uh, it's a good question. Uh, you, can, you can do whatever. Uh, you can uh, look from uh, uh, one. So what I asked you to read was book one book four and book nine, I believe. So, uh, so you could turn to those books uh, or concentrate on book one and, and maybe just with an eye to what happens ultimately in, in the epic. Um, or if you want to look at other books, it's entirely up to you. But you probably want to at least have book one uh, under your belt. Okay, I hope that helps. Good. Um, <clears throat> So Beelzebub posits an easier enterprise. So he says, so God rules here in hell even. We can't take heaven. It's an illusion to think that we can rule here because we don't. He rules here as well. He's omnipotent. So why don't we take over this newly created world of humans? So uh, I just want to point out the logical absurdity here. So we can't take over heaven because it's impregnable. We're staying here, but we, we can't rule here because he's omnipotent. He controls, he's, he's all powerful and rules everything. Therefore, why don't we try to take over there? Okay, so I think we've, he's forgotten already that, like, the, that let's say, the, the lack of logical consistency between God is omnipotent and rules everywhere, and let's try a different place, just not a, a consistent conclusion from the premise. Uh, the, so the reader is in this long dialogue, you know, the reader's sitting there going, oh, great, a narrative conclusion to the question. You know, oh, there's a good solution. Yeah, why don't you go take over the earth and humanity? And then it kind of dawns on the reader, you know, that first of all, the logical flaw, but also this is a dark plan to ruin humanity. It's not something to cheer for, you know. We're sucked into the debate. We're sucked into the rhetoric. And then we realize, oh, wait, this is their plan to destroy us. Uh, and then Satan offers himself as a, as a savior, say, okay, I'll do this. I'll take this tough mission on, and uh, this, uh, which parallels the son, the son of God volunteering himself to die for humanity's sins in book three. Um, and then I just want to uh, turn to this, this, the, these lines, 496. Book two, 496. Uh, So starting um, here, um, so he they've resolved their uh, their debate, their dialogue, and they they come into a great con yeah that's right let's take that over and there's a concord and everyone has has um, has uh, agreed that Satan doing this is a very heroic act and they all come together on this plan and um, and. And this, I think, comment uh, on from the narrator, I think, is in a way a key to the whole epic. This and and there's parallel phrasing in Book Ten around again um, how the key to Adam and Eve's um, resolution of their strife, but also their reconciliation with God, is about about this kind of humility and love as opposed to uh, uh, a continuing strife. Uh, so the narrator says, O oh, shame to men, devil with devil damned, firm concord holds. Men only disagree of creatures rational, though under hope of heavenly grace and God proclaiming peace, yet live in hatred, enmity, and strife among themselves and live, levy cruel wars, wasting the earth each other to destroy, as if, which might induce us to accord, 
man had not hellish foes enough besides that day and night for his destruction wait so shame to humanity uh isn't it a shame isn't it shameful to humanity that here devils with other devils are able to come to concord even though they're damned and in hell um only humanity of all rational creatures so there's all the beasts remember the chain of chain of being there's you know god angels humanity and then beasts lower animals you know insects etc uh, plants so uh plants are living things that have a vegetative soul they're able to live and grow but they can't move and they definitely don't have reason so animals have a vegetative aspect they grow they etc but they they can also move so that they can they move around that's it so they have this animal aspect to their spirit but they don't have reason reason starts on that chain of being with humanity angels have it in a more purified form and then obviously god so uh of of the rational creatures only humanity uh only uh men only disagree only humans are ones that are in discord with one another even fallen angels according to this uh of creatures rational though under hope of heavenly grace so they have hope of heavenly grace these fallen angels don't but they're still able to come to concord okay as opposed to eternal strife um so even though god proclaims peace humanity lives in hatred enmity and strife among themselves and levy cruel wars wasting the earth so there's the wars against one another um each other to destroy as if which might induce us to accord men had not hellish foes enough so it's it's as if we didn't have enough going against us with all these fallen angels trying to bring us down that we still need to 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 battle one another and this is uh i think a reference to uh um uh orlando furioso at this other uh, <coughs> renaissance epic uh about uh uh well about uh, uh this fig uh, this orlando character and uh his first of all his love interest but also his uh uh pure christian battle against these uh uh muslim forces okay so this uh uh this epic sees the enemy as as muslim forces that have to be uh battled in in a uh uh just pilgrimage of sorts and um uh crusade sorry i'm looking for that word crusade um the uh and in that uh epic the narrator similarly says you know isn't it uh, shameful that we but here he's not talking about humanity he's talking about christian battle one another rather than battle our common foe so to hear the logic is the same except it's broadened more universally so here it's it milton saying not that Christians should get together and battle a common uh let's say the other human foe of a, a different religious viewpoint rather humanity in general should come to concord and and, and fo follow the dictates of reason as opposed to finding strife with one another another and their concord uh could be a way of collectively fighting back the forces of fallen angels and as i said this is absolutely mirrored in the in in some of the uh the the words of um of uh adam and eve toward the end of of the epic and let's try to see those if we can um um let's see here uh 
Yeah, in book ten, I won't turn, I won't turn to it on the in the lines, but I'll just refer you to it. Um, this is book ten, uh, lines nine fifty nine to sixty one. <clears throat> this is Adam nine fifty eight. Uh, book 10, 958. This is Adam. They're starting to resolve. Adam and Eve had been uh, battling. Eve is the first to humbly say, okay, you know, let's stop fighting. So in a way, Eve, you could make the case that Eve is the hero of the poem. And Adam, here after discoursing a bit, they, Adam says, but rise, let us no more contend nor blame each other. Blamed enough elsewhere, but strive in offices of love, how we may lighten each other's burden in our share of woe. So rather than, let's not blame one another. We're blamed enough. We're blamed enough for being fallen. You know, we're blamed by God. You know, we've got fallen angels coming after us. We, we've got enough going on here. So rather than blame one another, let's strive in offices of love, how we may lighten each other's burden. So, so part of the fall is, you know, he's got a labor. Uh, so before, uh, before in, in Eden, the, the earth gave forth more freely of the fruits. Uh, now he's, you know, the sweat of thy brow, you will, you will make your bread and she will, um, she will suffer in childbirth. You know, they've been damned with certain, the fall has, has made, has meant that their lives will now be more, uh, Will be will be more toilsome. Will be there will be suffering. So what they need to do now, as opposed to blame one another, as opposed to continue in strife, is to lighten each other's burden in offices of love. In our share, uh, lighten each other's burden in our share of woe. Since this day's death denounced, if aught I see will prove no sudden, but a slow paced evil. So we've been we've been told that. We've eaten of the fruit, and that means death. But from what I see, it's not going to be quick. It's going to be slow. You know, we're going to have a lifetime to go through, and and we're going to have suffering to, to go through. Let's lighten each other's burden then. Um, a long day's dying to augment our pain, and to our seed, O oh, hapless seed, derive. So this and this suffering will be passed on to our to our um, to our children. Uh, and then I'll just repeat this here too. Uh, so later, again in book 10, um, he says, 10, 1085, to the place repairing where he judged us, prostrate fall before him reverent, and there confess humbly our faults and pardon beg with tears watering the ground and with our sighs the air frequenting sent from hearts contrite, in sign of sorrow unfeigned and humiliation meek. So humbly and humiliation. So, so uh, it, the message of humility is, is emphasized twice in those lines. And those lines are repeated again in lines 1098 to 1104. So those exact same lines are repeated just a few lines later by the narrator. Uh, so here it's Adam proposing it, and then the narrator repeats it when he describes them actually doing it. Um, the only case of that happening in the epic where we have repeated lines, I think we're, as readers, we're meant to stand up and notice those as important lines. That this, somehow the message here, the message from the ones I underscored before about how we're meant to lighten each other's burden, and also this, this lines about, oh, shame to, to men, oh, shame to humanity that we cannot end our eternal strife uh, when, when even fallen angels can, uh, seems to be a, a, a real key to it all. And, and seen in that light, I think, you know, we can put the perspective on this question of Satan. So is Satan a hero or is our perspective on Satan as this aggressive, heroic, uh, in heroic in the sense of a battle wager, uh, one who fights, one who strives with pride about my injured merit. And that's what we expect from traditional epics. And it's what we, 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 we've come to expect through the tradition. 
but uh, Milton seems to be uh, writing a different sort of epic here where the, the heroism is, I would say, is in these acts of humility. It is in that act of, Eve's act of originally reconciling when they were in strife, of, of the action of both of them in humbly asking forgive, for forgiveness from God. So with that, I want to, uh, to close the discussion of Paradise Lost um, and, uh, and, and see if there's any questions. And sure enough, I have a question. Um, just confirming for the final exam, does it need a work cited for peer-reviewed articles and in-text citations? Uh, yeah, if, if you do cite peer-reviewed articles, please do uh, have, have a work cited. Uh, in some way. Um, if you're just citing the poem, there isn't necessarily a need for a work cited, uh, but, but cite, the, cite the line numbers and book numbers as I do here in parentheses, you know, uh, so, so I know where you're quoting from. Okay, I hope that helps. Good question. Any other questions uh, about either Paradise Lost, about, about the final exam? Okay, well, I hope, I hope you uh, have enjoyed this course. I hope, uh, despite the, uh, the circumstances in which it had to be delivered, uh, I hope you enjoyed the works that we've studied and have gotten a bit of a taste for this period of English literature and, and some of the great works that we covered and, and have an appetite to go back to them. And, and, um, and I hope that uh, your uh, preparation for the final exam, both for this course and any other courses you may be taking goes well. As always, you can contact me if there's a question between now and, and uh, the due date of the final exam, and um, all the best. Thank you.